right up over the top of, of Neptune, very, very close to Neptune. The trajectory was then bent by gravity, moved south, and we intercepted Triton uh, while it was behind Neptune uh, and underneath it. Well, as we got closer and closer to Triton, it got smaller and smaller and smaller, and at the same time, brighter and brighter. It turned out to be the brightest thing we've seen in the solar system. North of the polar cap, in the north, just above the equator, we find one thing we call the cantaloupe terrain. Uh, it has a uh, uh, system of criss-crossing ridges, uh, which uh, uh, produce a set of almost squarish to ovoid dimples throughout the surface. Now we're talking about a surface which is 37 degrees above absolute zero. This is the coldest thing in the solar system by far. Even the cold atmospheres of things like Neptune are, are, are warmer. It was unthinkable to find activity going on a planet whose surface temperature is that low. I mean, this is getting down to the point where molecules stop. It was about a month after the Voyager encounter that uh, we were looking at uh, stereo images way down in the southernmost part of uh, Triton's polar cap. And we saw most of the features uh, lined up as if they were on a perfect sphere. In fact, the two best examples turn out to be active eruptions in which material is being blown from the surface in a vertical column to an altitude of uh, eight kilometers, roughly five miles. Voyager discovered six new moons at uh, Neptune. Uh, two of them were found in the uh, ring arc or ring system uh, orbiting uh, along two of the ring arcs, so uh, apparently shepherding uh, the edges of those ring arcs in some way. When we look at Neptune's ring system, as we can see here in this mosaic, we see three continuous rings quite easily. There is an outer ring. It's the ring in which, in fact, the three arcs are embedded. There is an inner ring which, at, in high phase geometry, appears brighter uh, than the outer ring. That tells us right away it's dusty, dustier than the outer ring. And then we see an inner, more diffuse ring at something like 42,000 kilometers from the center of, this, of the planet. We believe now that we'll be able to communicate with Voyager essentially as long as it stays alive. Two things will probably stop its life. First of all, it has a power source on board, which is a small nuclear power source called radioisotope thermal generators. And they operate by the, the radioactive decay of plutonium, which generates heat, which in turn is converted into electricity. In about 20 to 25 years, we expect to be low enough so that there's not enough power to keep the critical subsystems of the spacecraft operating. Or, at about the same time, we could possibly run out of attitude control fuel. That's the fuel which goes through little thrusters, which keeps the spacecraft stabilized and pointed at the Earth. Now, between the stars, there's a dilute gas, ionized gas, filling inter interstellar space. It's called the interstellar medium. Each star blows a bubble in that interstellar gas. Our own sun does that. That bubble, in the case of our sun, is called the heliosphere. We don't know how large that bubble is. It may be that the distance to the edge of the bubble, called the heliopause, is a hundred times the distance from the Earth to the Sun. That is three times further than it is out to Neptune. In which case, 25 years, Voyager 1, which will at that point be 130 times as far from the Sun as the Earth, could well be returning data from interstellar space for the first time. There will be a part of Earth which will roam essentially forever in the galaxy, and that will be the Voyager spacecraft.